Did you know there's an official Gen 3 Pokemon game that's completely lost to time? It was called Pokemon Garden, and you're watching footage of it right now. It had some original music and even had voice acting. <laughs> Pokemon Garden was only released in Japanese, but as of this video's publication, it can't even be played in Japan, or anywhere else for that matter. But there's a team of archivists who spent the last few years trying to recover it and make it playable in English. We'll talk more about that towards the end of the video, but for now, let's discuss the game itself. Well, actually there's four lost games we want to cover today, but we'll start with Pokemon Garden since it's our favorite. By the end of Gen 3, Game Freak and Nintendo were seeing a pattern. Each new generation sold significantly less than what came before. Older fans felt they'd grown up and didn't want to play Pokemon anymore, a phenomenon Game Freak called graduating. Meanwhile, the series was failing to pull in a younger audience who could take their place. So they partnered with Bascule to make Pokemon Garden, a game primarily targeted at Japanese elementary students. It also aimed to bring back older fans by kicking off Pokemon's first large-scale web campaign. The whole internet thing was relatively new back then, so this was Pokemon's big online blitz. So even though Pokemon Garden looks like a Game Boy Advance game, it was never put on a cartridge. Instead, it was only only playable on a computer through Yahoo Kids Japan. Pokemon Garden launched on July 7th, 2006, a few months before Diamond and Pearl released in Japan. It started like any other Pokemon game, asking what you want your name to be, but it also goes a step further by letting you choose your trainer class. Then you march up to this four-story Game Boy building where the rest of the game takes place. The first floor is the lobby, where you can schedule your appointments to ride the Pokemon Time Machine. There is at least a two hour wait time for the machine, so until then, you can read Pokemon news updates or play mini games on these arcade machines. They record high scores just like real arcade cabinets, so if you're good enough, you can make a permanent impact on the world. At the scheduled time, you'll get a call telling you to climb aboard the time machine. You'll get your pick of the Diamond Tour or Pearl Tour. Yo, Pokemon You'll be joined by 10 other people playing online just like you and taken to an interactive tour of Pokemon's history. Each tour lasts about 30 minutes. Depending on decisions you make as a team and how you react when the time machine malfunctions, events can play out a little differently. <laughs> So therefore, you're encouraged to ride it again and again. After you safely return to the present day, all the passengers take a commemorative photo together. Then you can ride the escalators upstairs to the gallery. You can actually see the lobby below through the gallery floor. There's three doors, and behind each one is a gallery dedicated to a specific region. The Kanto Gallery, Johto, and one from Hoenn. Each room has music specific to that region, and comes with an upper balcony room. Inside you can see official artwork including concept art, maps, character art, and you can read about the Pokemon native to each region. You could also chat with other people in the gallery, who are actually other people playing online, not NPCs. Game Freak's office is on the third floor, and you can poke around and watch the developers working hard to make Gen 4, or chat with the devs like Jinichi Masuda and Ken Sugimori, who share trivia and show you silhouettes of Pokemon who haven't been released yet. Interestingly, some information they shared turned out to be not true, like that Sinnoh's starters would be fighting, dark, and psychic types. In their offices, you could check out the developers' Pokemon teams and watch videos of them, like this one of Sugimori drawing Gengar. There's also a Pokemon quiz if you want to test your trivia, and a couple of hidden rooms you can only access with secret passwords. If you sleuth your way into the secret diamond room, you could download this exclusive wallpaper for your computer background, and you could get this one in the Pearl Room. The fourth floor is a souvenir shop where you can buy stuff like emoticons and stickers. To earn in-game cash, you'll need to play the arcade machines in the lobby or enter tournaments on the top floor. Well, maybe top floor is not the best way to describe it. It's more like the inside of Pokeballs on the building's roof. 
they open up and each one is as big as a stadium inside. These tournaments are essentially rock, paper, scissors, but instead of rock, paper, scissors, you use Pokemon types, water beats fire, fire beats grass, and so on. Winning against other players gets you in-game money, and if you beat enough opponents, you take on NPC Game Masters. There's a lot more to it, but we don't want to bore you with every detail, so that's the long and short of it. Looked at as a whole, Pokemon Garden amounts to an interactive Pokemon museum and theme park. It was initially scheduled to shut down five months after it opened, but it was extended another month due to popular demand. A lot of the footage in this video comes from a press release made for investors, which boasts of Garden's million plus visitors and even attributes to the success of Diamond or Pearl to this unprecedented online campaign. Diamond or Pearl broke this series' downward sales spiral and managed to outperform both Gen 3 and the Gen 1 remakes. How much of that can actually be attributed to Pokemon Garden is impossible to say, but this investor video sure seems to think it played a big part. Garden was so popular in fact that after it closed, it was reopened again. This time permanently, they said, but interest tapered off as time went on and so it was eventually closed forever. However, as we mentioned earlier, there's a group of preservationists trying to resurrect it once again and make it playable in English. It's some of the same folks who recently released fan localizations of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Wii games that only released in Japan, which you could play right now if you wanted to, thanks to these guys. Unfortunately though, restoring Pokemon Garden is a bit trickier than localizing Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Wii. Garden was technically a Flash game, so the only way to restore it is to find fans who played it 15 years ago and ask for their browser cache. And we're not talking cache as in money, an internet cache is essentially a computer's stored data of websites it accessed in the past. The preservationists use them like puzzle pieces to put the game back together, but it isn't easy finding people with computers that old that are still working. And one person's cache is only part of the picture. With their project leader, MVIT, translator Higsby, and a few researchers, they've made good progress, but 100% completion's gonna be impossible without community support. That's why we made this video! If you ever played Pokemon Garden, please visit this link. Or, if you know anyone else who played it, ask them to visit this link. It's called Flashpoint, and it'll check your browser cache for Flash games so you can donate them to all Flash restoration projects, including this one. Hopefully someday soon, Pokemon Garden can be restored for fans all around the world to experience firsthand. There are three more lost Pokemon games they hope to recover as well. After Garden's closure, the official website announced Pokemon Mazeland, a comparatively simple game where you run through Pokemon-shaped mazes. Any Pokemon from generations 1 through 4 were fair game, and every day fans could explore four of them. In each maze, you're supposed to find four checkpoints, collect plates, and you can even chat with other players. There's still a lot of missing information about this one because not as many people played it compared to Garden, so there's fewer internet caches recovered. Another game was Pokemon Sky Tower, which launched side by side with Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and was seemingly inspired by the real life Sky Tree in Tokyo. Long story short, it's a Pokemon trivia competition that uses info from the first four generations of Pokemon, hosted by this guy in a Burmy costume. You compete against other players online, and for each correct answer, you ascend one floor of the Sky Tower. Get one wrong, and you go down a floor, and the first one to make it to the 100th floor wins. The game was only playable from 6am to midnight, and the tower had a pretty cool day-night cycle. There's a lot of missing data and information, but it's worth noting that Mazeland and Sky Tower both had online leaderboards. The last game is Pokemon Dream World, which unlike these other games did originally release in English. It was also technically a Flash game, but it had the ability to connect directly to Pokemon Black, White, Black 2, and White 2. You could even send Pokemon from your DS into Dream World to collect exclusive items and catch new Pokemon, including some Pokemon that you couldn't catch in a Generation 5 game. Probably the best way to describe Dream Worlds like a simpler Pokemon version of Animal Crossing. Each player had their own customizable home where they could visit other players' homes as well. Unova doesn't have any soft soil for growing berries, but you get your own berry garden in Dream World, and you can send berries back to Unova. You can unlock new areas in the Island of Dreams like the windswept sky, sparkling sea, and spooky manor each with their own mini-games, Pokemon, and items to collect. 
Pokemon and items collected in the Dream World could be sent back to the DS games, and every Pokemon had hidden abilities. For a lot of them, it was actually the only way to obtain those abilities. Some were unlocked for free, while others cost Dream Points earned by playing minigames, making friends with other players, and watering berries for them. That's nice. The Dream World also appeared in the Pokemon Adventures manga, as an alternative dimension that Pokemon visit in their sleep. The game was shut down early in 2014, the same day as all of Gen 5's online functionalities, rendering it completely unplayable, just like the other games that we talked about. Again, if you ever played Garden, Mazeland, Sky Tower, or Dream World, please visit the link to share your flash cache. It can mean the difference between these games getting resurrected or languishing in the afterlife for all eternity. If they're ever brought back from the dead, we'll be sure to let you know in a future video. Did you know that after Metroid Prime 3 was finished, one of its developers pitched a game called Metroid Tactics? Or that Next Level Games was building a Metroid game with PS3 level graphics codenamed Project Valkyrie? And years before that, Miyamoto was pushing for Metroid to get a sequel on the Nintendo 64? We talked to some former employees of Retro Studios, Next Level Games, Nintendo, Rareware, and even Rockstar to learn more about all three games, and why they never saw the light of day. There's lots to cover, so we'll jump straight into it with Metroid Tactics, a concept pitched internally at Retro Studios by a member of the Metroid Prime team, Paul Tozer. Did you know gaming spoke with Paul a few months ago, and he was kind enough to tell us about this piece of Metroid history that before now, no one outside of Retro even knew existed. Metroid Tactics was aimed at the Wii, and Paul wrote up the pitch in late 2007, pretty much immediately after Metroid Prime 3 was finished. As far as the story goes, Tactics would have been a series prequel. According to the pitch document, the events in this game take place long before all other games in the Metroid series. It marks the very moment when Samus Aran first separates from the Chozo who raised her from childhood, encounters humanity, and becomes a bounty hunter. The game also marks humankind's very first encounter with the space pirates and Metroids. Samus must cooperate with an elite team of highly trained Galactic Federation troopers and colorful bounty hunters to stop the incursion on several Galactic Federation planets, at various locations on planets such as Norion and Earth, and eventually take on the space pirates at their outpost on planet Zebus. As for the gameplay, it's basically XCOM, Paul told us. It was XCOM in the Metroid universe, except instead of fighting aliens, you're fighting space pirates, who are also aliens, but different. If you're not familiar with XCOM, it's like a more mature and complex version of Mario and Rabbids gameplay, sort of in the same ballpark as Fire Emblem, Advance Wars, and Final Fantasy Tactics. In XCOM, about half the game is grid-based tactical combat, and the other half is spent at your base hiring and outfitting soldiers, building base expansions like genetics labs and satellite uplinks, having your scientists research new weapons and equipment, and so on. XCOM was a revolutionary PC game back in 1994, then in 2012 got a remake for the PS3, Xbox 360, Vita, PC, mobile, basically every platform that wasn't Nintendo. Maybe because it was rated M? But of course, Retro would have had its own unique spin on the XCOM formula. According to the pitch document, Metroid Tactics allows the player to control the legendary Samus Aran, a squad of elite Galactic Federation troops, and various other bounty hunters as they work together to defeat the space pirates. Along the way, the player can hire new units and upgrade all of the units in his team with many different kinds of new armor, weapons, skills, and abilities, with Samus and the various bounty hunters having a large number of unique abilities that will prove invaluable in combat. Samus is the main character, but you don't really play as Samus. She's just one soldier under the player's command. So, who's the player character? Uh, okay, player takes the role of a Galactic Federation commander, um, even has a name for him I'm not gonna repeat. Pretty stupid name. Um, Paul had grown to dislike the name he came up with 15 years earlier, but he showed it to us eventually. It's Galactic Federation Commander Justin Bailey. That's a reference to the famous password for the original NES Metroid that removed Samus's power suit. Justin Bailey was one of those gaming mysteries that survived for decades, long rumored to be the name of one of the developers or an inside joke, but in reality was just a randomly generated password. As Commander Bailey, you acquire cash by completing missions, and extra cash by accomplishing side objectives like rescuing civilians on the battlefield. 
Space pirates drop their weapons and other technology after they're killed, which can be sold off for even more cash. Back at the base, you can spend your space bucks to hire Galactic Federation troopers and extremely powerful bounty hunters, who of course are more expensive, and also purchase weapons, armor, various equipment, and skill upgrades. According to the doc, each unit will have abilities specific to that character. For example, Samus will be able to use her Power Beam, Plasma Beam, Nova Beam, which can pass through walls and can damage multiple enemies in sequence, Missile, Ice Missile, which freezes non-boss enemies for several turns, Super Missile, Seeker Missile, Boost Ball, that has fast movement and can damage and knock back enemies, and Power Bombs. The doc goes on to explain how each unit can earn experience through battle, and they'll gain access to new abilities. Like Samus can't use her Seeker Missile ability from the get-go, but will acquire it at a later level. Galactic Federation troopers are the grunts, carrying weapons like pistols, machine guns, sniper rifles, grenades, and recovered space pirate weapons. Leveling up through experience allows them to increase their accuracy, detect enemies at a longer distance, and expand their maximum AP. AP, or action points, are how every character moves and attacks. Every action costs a certain amount of AP. For example, a trooper can fire a standard shot for 2 AP, a burst shot for 4, or throw a grenade at the cost of 8 AP. The AP system is illustrated by the pitch document's one and only mock-up screenshot, which shows Samus and a couple of troopers fighting a space pirate and a berserker pirate. At this moment, it's one of the troopers' turns. So far, he spent 7 of his 12 AP, and his options are movement, shooting, taking a crouch stance, and guard mode. During gameplay, all these options are selected with the Wii's pointer controls. The pitch doc says Metroid Tactics uses a control interface similar to mouse-driven turn-based PC game interfaces, but highly customized for the Wii, then lays out details for button functions and so forth. The Berserker's battle is meant to be one of the game's boss fights. Talking more about bosses, the doc says, Metroid Tactics presents a unique opportunity in the scale and scope of the major battles, and the presence of massive boss creatures and challenging boss-like encounters that will demand the utmost of the player's tactical decision-making. Many of the most famous creatures from the Metroid franchise, such as Ridley and the Berserker Pirate, are a natural fit for the massive boss battles that will require the utmost of Samus and her team, and the doc ends with an explanation of why the game should get made. Four points are given, bringing Metroid's huge boss battles into an entirely new genre, inventive uses of the Wii Remote, that it'll be pretty cheap to produce since it can reuse much of the Prime Trilogy's engine, models, and animations, and the format makes multiplayer easy to develop without having to worry too much about network performance or bandwidth. In other words, online frame drops won't break a tactics game like they would in a first-person shooter. So why didn't Metroid Tactics get made? The pitch was designed and presented by Paul Tozer, a huge Metroid fan who joined Retro Studios after Metroid Prime, and became one of the programmers for Prime 2 and 3. Retro was getting kind of burnt out on Metroid after the second Prime game and wanted to move on to another IP. That's when they asked Nintendo if they could make a Zelda spin-off starring Sheik. But Satoru Iwata asked them to make one more Metroid Prime to finish the trilogy, which they did. Then afterwards, Retro really wanted to move on. We heard this from several other retro guys we spoke to. They called it franchise fatigue. But Paul was one of the team members still gung-ho on Metroid, and was ready for Prime 4, or a spin-off like Metroid Tactics. He ended up quitting the same week Retro switched to making Donkey Kong games. As far as his credentials, Paul's got design credits on three strategy games that did release, and he also helped write the design for Heroes of Hyrule, the Zelda Tactics game Retro cooked up three years earlier. We talked about that pitch a few months ago. We'll have a link in the description in case you missed that video. But while Heroes of Hyrule had several developers working on it before ultimately getting rejected by Nintendo, Metroid Tactics was just Paul, and it got rejected by Retro's higher-ups. Nintendo never saw the pitch. Paul told us, If there was a way to pitch something from inside Retro Studios that would make it all the way up the chain to Nintendo, and actually get approved for production, then I never figured out what it was, and no one else at Retro did either. In order to succeed, a pitch would have to enlist the support of then-design lead Mark Pacini, studio head Michael Kelbaugh, and Nintendo producer Kensuke Tanabe. And those three individuals had wildly different tastes, and perspectives on gameplay and different goals for what they wanted to see Retro Studios working on. Knowing what we know now, there's a good chance Nintendo would have rejected the pitch anyway since they started development on Metroid Other M around the same time, and it's unlikely they would have greenlit two Metroid games to release so close together on the same console. And, well, that's the story of Metroid Tactics from start to finish. A cool idea from the Metroid Prime team that just never got any traction. Sure would be cool to see an XCOM fan mod someday, though. Okay, now for the next game. 
In 2014, three pieces of concept art were accidentally shared online by a former artist at Next Level Games, the studio probably best known today as the developers of Luigi's Mansion 2 and 3. Most of the guys we reached out to weren't willing to talk, and pretty much everyone who would talk wanted to remain anonymous, so we're gonna have to leave out a lot of names. But essentially, a former Next Level artist posted these three pieces on his art website. One shows a stylized Samus design. Two Samuses, actually, which we'll explain here in just a minute. The second piece shows a giant boss creature. Zoom in and you can see some humans providing scale. And the last piece was another boss design, but with less work put into it. If you Google this cancelled project nowadays, you won't find much. Just this fan wiki calling it a cancelled 3DS game. And a few articles published back when the art surfaced, saying, It's unlikely we'll receive solid answers as to what exactly this art is from, or what it could have been. And that, sadly, we may never know the full story. Well, after looking into it, we did get the full story. It was called Project Valkyrie, a series of prototypes built over the course of seven years, although development actually began on the Nintendo DS, not the 3DS. We talked to three former Next Level devs. One of them said, As far as we got with it, it was a pretty straightforward multiplayer deathmatch. The first version on DS was very small, I remember. The dev team was probably less than five or six people. I don't think it was anything beyond that. I think I was the only 3D character modeler on that project at that time. So I was the one doing all those Samus iterations and power-up icons. The goal was essentially to make an online, standalone version of the multiplayer modes found in Metroid Prime Hunters and Metroid Prime 2. Next Level worked on the DS version of Project Valkyrie for about four months. They call this DS version Phase 1 of Development, and it was pretty basic, with each player controlling a different Samus. There was an orange one, a purple one, and so on. When Samus's concept art made its way online, some fans thought the art style was pretty weird. But the modeler told us the in-game models were pretty faithful to what Samus looked like in Metroid Prime, but with far fewer polygons. The second Samus in that concept art shows some glowing panels on Samus' suit. These were added to help players see each other at a distance. And the concept art was labeled Valkyrie because that was the game's codename, Project Valkyrie. That's a reference to Norse mythology. Valkyries are feminine figures who guide the souls of the dead into the afterlife. Our anonymous modeler also made an in-game model for this boss concept. He remembers it as a legless crustacean-like creature with mantis arms and articulate mandibles. Kind of like a hydralisk from StarCraft. But it wasn't something players teamed up to beat. The bosses were more like obstacles. Killing your opponents was still the primary focus, and giant enemies running amok were there to enhance the PvP experience. As for the battlefield, Phase 1 was still early days, so they'd only built a pretty flat, basic environment. But Next Level had never made a portable game before, only home console titles, and they were having trouble getting Valkyrie off the ground. I remember the programmers had really huge trouble making it, another dev told us. Because we were used to developing on a more powerful console, it was four players, but they were super low res. They didn't look very good because it was on Nintendo DS. After about four months, Nintendo decided to pull the plug. Next Level was always careful never to say publicly that they worked on Metroid, but here's how their director Bryce Holiday described their project's termination a few years later. He told Kotaku, We were developing something in secret, like we usually do working with Nintendo. There was a conference call, where it was kind of announced to us that we would stop working on what we were currently doing and start, they even added a little drum roll, to work on Luigi's Mansion 2. Kensuke Tanabe is a funny guy, and he was trying to get me excited for this bad news. Someone else on the call said there was about 30 seconds of stunned silence. In hindsight, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to them. Luigi's Mansion 2 went on to shatter all expectations, selling twice as many copies as the GameCube original, and outselling the entire Metroid Prime trilogy combined. After Luigi's Mansion launched in 2013, Nintendo had Next Level start working on a few more secret projects, including a Wii U mech game. But we don't want to get sidetracked talking about other projects, so we'll keep this story centered on Metroid. Long story short, Nintendo eventually told them to cancel everything else and focus on resurrecting Project Valkyrie. The devs call this stage of development Phase 2. Now, with the team tripled in size, they were leaving the underpowered DS behind and developing console-level assets. All the original code was thrown out, but the core idea remained the same, four-player online deathmatch. The 3D modeler told us, Phase 2 was for a more Wii U-like hardware, as we were much less restricted on things like polygon count. It wasn't explicitly for the Wii U, but the prototype we were working on had none of the technical constraints of Phase 1. It wasn't clear what the original platform was yet, but it would have been vastly more powerful than the original DS, so we began in a more ambitious direction. 
The models for the weapons, enemies, and environments were closer to a PS3 game at that point. The battlefield was a more robust environment. I think it was like inside a space station kind of feel. There was a boss I made that was sort of a tripod inside an orb, that when you shot it enough it would open up and change forms. It was definitely inspired by the War of the Worlds tripods. A little less organic, more mechanical, but still that whole like tall walking alien thing. Players could also collect upgrades to get an advantage over their opponents like missiles, speed boosters, teleportation power-ups, stronger lasers, and so on. There was also parts of the stage you could destroy with certain weapons, like destroying walls that had upgrades hidden behind them, strategic high ground, or shortcuts to flank your enemies, and of course morph ball sized tunnels to roll around in. But we should note that the 3D modeler we talked to left the company before Phase 2 was finished, so he can't confirm if tunnels or the tripod were ever implemented, but that's the direction they were headed when he walked out the door. However, not long after he left, Project Valkyrie's development took a major turn. Kensuke Tanabe, the same guy who did the drum roll and told them Phase 1 was cancelled, had actually been wanting to make a story-based game that focused on Federation soldiers since the original trilogy wrapped up. As a producer at Nintendo, he oversaw both Retro Studios and Next Level Games, and with Retro now working on Donkey Kong, he saw this as an opportunity to have Next Level finally make his idea into a reality. He also wanted it to be a launch title for the new Nintendo 3DS, an upgraded 3DS model releasing holiday 2014. As a result, the graphics had to get scaled down dramatically to work on a handheld. We talked to another team member who stayed on till the project was finished. He said, We were told it should be a co-op game, four players, in the Metroid Prime universe. That was kind of our directive. Nintendo were quite specific that that's what they wanted. But once they told us that, we still had creative freedom in designing levels and stuff but the overall vision of the game was four-player co-op in the Metroid universe. If you haven't figured it out already, what happened to Project Valkyrie was that it ultimately got transformed into Metroid Prime Federation Force. Instead of a fast-paced PvP deathmatch in the Metroid universe, Federation Force was a slower co-op title with an emphasis on PvE, player versus environment. In other words, up to four players teaming up to solve puzzles and fight enemies through a story-focused campaign. Despite its reputation, Federation Force really wasn't that bad. Browse through YouTube reviews nowadays and you'll see most folks who gave it a chance actually liked it for what it was, as opposed to hating it for what it wasn't. If released back when Metroid was practically an annual franchise, it probably would have gotten a similar reception as Metroid Prime Hunters and Pinball. But that wasn't the situation. After all those years without a traditional Metroid, fans were in no mood for Federation Force. Making things worse, the game ended up being delayed more than a year past the new 3DS launch window and wasn't ready until 2016. When Federation Force finally hit store shelves, it managed to sell only 150,000 copies, making it the worst-selling Metroid game of all time. It's impossible to know if Project Valkyrie would have fared any better, but it probably couldn't have done much worse. To close out the story, we talked to one more team member who told us, The prototypes were more like Quake, like a Quake game but Metroid. I think to this day I'm more in love with the early exploration than I am with the final product. And that's the story of Project Valkyrie a seven-year development story starting on Nintendo DS, upgrading to a console-level graphics Quake-like project, then ultimately turning into Federation Force. Okay, now on to Metroid 64. But before we get to the modern-day quotes, let's dig through some old magazines to see what the devs said back in the 90s. Tons of classic Nintendo series made their transition to 3D on the Nintendo 64, but that didn't necessarily have to be the path forward for Metroid. Miyamoto still had a lot of enthusiasm for 2D games in the early 3D era, as well as excitement for what the Nintendo 64 could achieve in 2D that wasn't possible on the Super Nintendo. And he said as much over the course of several magazine interviews. He told GameFan magazine in August 2000, Before, yes, the technology allowed us to only make 2D games, but now we have the option to make 3D games as well. It's not about a transition, but rather the expansion of the alternatives we now have. As a matter of fact, I don't think the possibility of 2D has died down at all. It will just keep on going. And he told Nintendo Power in October 1996, The N64 is really an interesting and exciting machine. In some cases, 2D images created on the N64 may be more interesting than 3D graphics. We can create high quality and cool 2D graphics. As for N64 Magazine UK, he said, 3D graphics are fine, but polygons offer a kind of solid graphics. And if you like it, that's alright, but texture mapped graphics are always limited to set ways, and they will always look similar. However, when it comes to 2D graphics, there's 
there's a variety of ways in which you can paint the original pictures that are used in the game. You could use an airbrush, you could use a pencil, you could use chalk, or many other ways. You can paint the pictures in any way you like. And in Gamers Republic November 1999 issue, he stated, After working for years on developing games on N64, I don't think it's necessarily right that action games all be in 3D. Nintendo didn't end up making many 2D games for N64, but Yoshi's Story is the best example of one that did get made. It was also the best-selling example, with Miyamoto describing it as 2.5D with a cardboard art style. As far as graphics and gameplay, Metroid 64 could have been a direct sequel to Super Metroid. A great template could have been Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which released six months after the Nintendo 64 hit store shelves and spawned the genre-defining term Metroidvania, even if it was meant to have a mocking connotation at the time. There were a lot of requests for Metroid 64 in the 90s, and Miyamoto said he was passing along fan letters to the guys in charge. He was also bringing it up in high-level meetings. Gamers Republic magazine asked Miyamoto, what remaining 16-bit sequels might we see on the Nintendo 64? Miyamoto laughed and said, well, Metroid. Although, I'm not the Metroid producer, whenever I come across the opportunity in a company meeting, I try to suggest it. Miyamoto had a lot of sway, but unfortunately Metroid wasn't under his control. The series was under Nintendo R&D 1, who were too busy making Virtual Boy games like Mario's Tennis and Wario Land, as well as Game Boy games like Wario Land 2 and 3 and the Game & Watch Gallery games. In fact, that's pretty much the only games they were making for the five years after Super Metroid. And according to Miyamoto, that was keeping them too busy to make any N64 games. What he didn't mention was that the Metroid series' sales were declining with each new entry, which was presumably one of the reasons 8-bit Wario was taking priority over 64-bit Samus. Wario Land sequels weren't just quicker and easier to make, they sold better too. And despite its critical acclaim, Symphony of the Night's sales were pretty lackluster. People just weren't really buying 2D games at the dawn of the 3D era. So even if Miyamoto was still a believer in 2D, financially speaking, 3D might have been the only viable option for Metroid 64. And that brings us to something of a roadblock. Super Metroid's director Yoshio Sakamoto's problems with 3D. Looking back years later, he said, I was actually thinking about the possibility of making a Metroid game for the N64, but I felt I shouldn't be the one making the game. When I held the N64 controller in my hands, I just couldn't imagine how it could be used to move Samus around. So for me, it was just too early to personally make a 3D Metroid. Using the joystick, just like any other 3D game, seems like the obvious answer, but Sakamoto has some interesting hang-ups when it comes to controllers. A decade later, he insists that Metroid Other M not use a Wii nunchuck, but instead only use the Wii remote held sideways, like an NES controller. In another interview, Sakamoto gave a few more reasons why he didn't make Metroid 64. That the story was already wrapped up at the end of Super Metroid. That it'd be difficult for his team at R&D 1 who made Game Boy games to make an N64 title, and that the console's graphical limitations would have made it difficult to achieve the realism the series was known for. Those are all pretty good reasons why R&D 1 wasn't the right team for the job. But the most interesting part of both these interviews is when Sakamoto says Nintendo asked an outside studio to make Metroid 64 for them. Essentially, the same thing Nintendo did a few years later when they outsourced Metroid Prime to Retro Studios. Except in that case, Retro accepted the offer. But for Metroid 64, the offer was refused. Quoting Sakamoto directly, he said, Nintendo at that time approached another company and asked them if they would make an N64 version of Metroid, and their response was that no, they could not. They turned it down, saying that unfortunately, they didn't have the confidence to create an N64 Metroid game that could compare favorably with Super Metroid. That's something I take as a compliment to what we achieved with Super Metroid. To us, that sounds like it might have been a polite way of declining Nintendo's offer, and maybe there was a bit more to the story. Which raises a couple of pretty big questions. Who did Nintendo ask to make Metroid 64, and what was the real reason they turned it down? Sakamoto purposely didn't say. He was asked to identify the studio, but he declined. Talking to folks in the industry, most rumors point to two Western studios. Rareware, the makers of Banjo-Kazooie and Goldeneye, and Rockstar, the makers of Lemmings and, of course, Grand Theft Auto. We set out to explore these rumors with mixed results, so let's get into it. One page of Nintendo history that's been mostly forgotten nowadays is the Ultra 64 Dream Team, about a dozen Western studios that Nintendo assembled to make exclusive third-party N64 games. Rareware was part of the Dream Team and so was DMA Design, the studio who later became Rockstar. 
At the time, the company's founder, David Jones, said they were, quote, effectively a first-party studio belonging to Nintendo, and Miyamoto himself was directly involved with the Dream Team's management, to the extent that one executive highlighted their relationship by saying, quote, Mr. Miyamoto came to the first meeting in San Diego. We had the honor that this mother effer came to us. We spent a few months tracking down some lower-level guys from different corners of Rockstar, and most of them said they would have loved to work on Metroid, but no, they didn't hear about an offer from Nintendo. So we talked to a couple Rockstar producers. One of them said he had heard the rumors back then, but as far as he knew, they were just rumors. We even spent an hour on the phone with Jamie King, one of the five guys who founded Rockstar Games back in 1998. He was more than just a founder, though. He worked on countless titles, including the GTA series and some games for the Nintendo 64. Jamie was very friendly and forthcoming. He'd heard the rumors, too, but again, just rumors. You can't go much higher than founders and producers. We can't rule out Rockstar with 100% certainty, but we're pretty confident they weren't the studio who turned down Metroid 64. So what about Rare? They were Nintendo's golden boy back in the 90s, and Miyamoto especially was a big fan. When he was asked what developers outside Nintendo he most admired, he didn't even have to think about it. Rare, he said. Rare makes very good games, but otherwise there are not many unusual or unique games out there at the moment, and that's what we should all be doing. Miyamoto expounded on that in other interviews, saying, quote, Rare's games are similar to Nintendo's, but the quality is extremely high. Rare has been able to make Nintendo 64 games which are even better looking than our own. Rare has done a lot for the gaming industry. All of Rare's games are 3D, but they all have very different gameplay. They are encouraging us to create a different genre of games that departs from 3D adventure gaming. Miyamoto was even in one of Rare's games, Perfect Dark. So we started looking into Rare. Just like Rockstar, the lower level staff didn't know much about it. But one guy we spoke to was Martin Wakeley, the head of Rare's design team back in the 90s. He told us, I do have a vague recollection of talking about it in the old boardroom. I would have been making the decisions from the dev team perspective, and if it was offered to us, I probably would have said yes. I think the most likely thing that happened was Nintendo could have approached Rare about it, but it was at a time when Rare were keen to establish their own IP, and as a result, get a higher cut of royalties. And it probably got rejected for that reason alone. I would have been the only person from the team involved in any discussions. Above me, it would have been Rare's management, Simon Farmer, or Rare's founders, the Stamper Brothers, who would have spoken to Nintendo. So, money. That sounded like a more realistic reason an outside studio would have passed on Nintendo's offer. It took another year to get a hold of Simon Farmer. He's a very private person, and from what we've gathered, he's retired on a beach somewhere. We thought we were getting close to solving the mystery, but unfortunately he told us, There's no Metroid dirt, so you're barking up the wrong tree. Have a mojito for me. We're friendly with former Rare producer Kevin Bayless, and he backed up Simon's comments, saying, Yeah, just a rumor. I used to spend a lot of time with Simon, so it sounded odd. If he'd have known, I'd have known. That means, if it was Rare, the only people who knew were the Stamper brothers. But they're infamous for almost never granting interviews, and unfortunately, we couldn't get them. For good measure, we also talked to some guys from Retro Studios, including Metroid Prime's original director, John Whitmore. He said Retro wasn't offered Metroid 64 and didn't think Rare did any work on it either. I think if Rare had done it, we would know about it. We also got in touch with Perrin Kaplan, a former Nintendo of America executive. In a 1997 magazine, she said she'd heard Metroid 64 was in development. But when we talked to her, she couldn't remember what she'd heard all those years ago, and neither could her business partner. We also spoke to a few other studios, but it was all wild goose chases and dead ends. So unfortunately, after two years of digging, we couldn't get a definitive answer on who turned down Metroid 64. As huge Metroid fans, we really want to fill this hole in the story. We've gotten kind of obsessed after all this time. So, we're putting out a bounty. Somewhere out there, there's some developers who knows the name of that studio, and we'll pay a thousand bucks to hear their side of the story. Our Twitter DMs are open. Message us anytime, and we'd be happy to keep your identity a secret. And also, here's some fine print so the terms of the bounty are clear and upfront. If we ever get the story, we'll share it in a future video. One of the biggest names in video games undoubtedly is Nintendo. It's a company responsible for what are often credited as some of the greatest games of all time. And yet, for every wacky game idea that Nintendo gives the green light to, there are many more they turn down and usually never end up getting made. In this video, we'll be examining a hand-picked selection of those obscure game pitches that were rejected by the Big N, including some that have never previously been reported on. 
The Art Academy series began late in the DS's life cycle in a collaboration between Headstrong Games and Nintendo. Having numerous entries across Nintendo's various systems since 2009, the series became increasingly associated with some of their biggest first party brands. In 2014, a Pokemon version of Art Academy was released on the 3DS. They also held a number of Nintendo themed competitions via the Wii U's Art Academy sketchpad, in which players had to draw pictures related to different properties, including Yoshi, Zelda, and Animal Crossing. At the rate they were going, it only seemed natural for Nintendo and Art Academy to continue growing closely intertwined. Headstrong Games appears to have thought so at least, as they pitched to Nintendo a game specifically built around Nintendo's characters and Art Academy coming together. Their working title for the potential game was Nintendo All-Stars Art Academy. It's said to have been pitched towards the end of work on Disney Art Academy, which released in 2016. Its premise was very similar to previous entries in the series like that one, with a few twists. According to a former employee, the team wanted to include facilities for making sprite art, and lessons for drawing iconic sprites from games like Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. Another feature they were hoping to include was a music studio that paid homage to Nintendo's own Mario Mario Paint for the SNES. Very similar to the music composer suite from that game, players were supposed to be able to create their own musical compositions in a simple Mario themed interface. The pitch was for a 3DS game consisting of early design documents and concept art, no prototype was ever developed. A source linked with Headstrong Games alleges that when it was presented to Nintendo, they weren't interested in pursuing more Art Academy games at the time and turned it down. While this first attempt at selling them on the concept was not not successful, there's always a chance that Nintendo could one day revisit it further down the line. Kuju Entertainment, the parent company of Headstrong, is said to still have a good relationship with them. Though certainly not without historical precedent, seeing Nintendo allow their characters to appear on non-Nintendo platforms is rare. Next on our list is an example of one such situation, where we could have seen one of their most acclaimed games of all time come to home computers. A small company named IDF pitched doing a port of Super Mario Bros. 3 to PC. It was worked on in September 1990, just less than two years on from the game's original release on the NES. The idea came about when programmer John Carmack developed code enabling fast side-scrolling graphics on PC. Combining Dangerous Dave, a character invented by his friend designer John Romero with a recreation of the opening from Super Mario Bros. 3, he came up with a demonstration. This would become known as Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. Romero was so enthusiastic about the game that the two agreed to team up and formally pitch an official port of Super Mario Bros. 3 to PC, using IDF as their company title. A prototype for the port was put together over the course of just one week by Romero and Carmack, who worked day and night on a budget of nothing. They even had to borrow computers to develop it on from the offices of Softdisk, the magazine where they were both working at the time. The playable demo was sent to Nintendo's offices in Kyoto via Nintendo of America, who reviewed it carefully. Ultimately, they decided against making a full game purely on the grounds that they were against developing games for systems they hadn't made themselves. One consolation for the developers, however, was that Nintendo Nintendo's higher-ups are said to have been very impressed by it. IFD might not have been able to score a contract with Nintendo, but success still came their way. The company soon changed its name to id Software, who would go on to make such games as Wolfenstein and Doom. Nintendo Software Technology was once one of Nintendo's most important Western studios. Responsible for games like Wave Race Blue Storm and Metroid Prime Hunters, they were a valued asset to Nintendo, helping to bolster their first party lineups. In 2009, the company's developers began wanting to make games for Nintendo's WiiWare platform and mapped out several proposals. Nintendo themselves had brought some occasional first party support to WiiWare, such as a Dr. Mario game and Pokemon Rumble. Nintendo Nintendo Software Technology, however, wanted to bring quite a bit more to the table, offering to develop a number of fully original games to be published by Nintendo. These would have been smaller new IPs for players of all ages. One of these pitches was for a quiz game about planet Earth, where players would have answered questions themed around different geographical locations. Another was a game about managing and organising a stage show. A former developer told me that these pitches were supposed to incorporate me characters too. Very little ever became of any 
NST's time spent formulating WiiWare pitches. Due to Nintendo's disinterest, they only ever reached the form of early documentation. This is mostly believed to have been down to the cancellation of their previous game, best known as Project Hammer, which ended up being one of Nintendo's largest ever internal failures. Its development ran for over five years until 2009, during which time millions upon millions of dollars had been poured into it. Consequently, Nintendo would allow them less creative freedom in the future and became hesitant to greenlight anything original they proposed. In the years since Project Hammer, Nintendo software technology has pitched many different projects only to have them turned down. Their WiiWare games make up only a small number of these. In the 2010s, many more staff have since left the company, with some citing the limited creative scope Nintendo allowed them. Q Games is a studio based in Kyoto, Japan that has enjoyed a close relationship with Nintendo over the years, collaborating on the Star Fox series. The company was founded by Dylan Cuthbert, who worked on the original Star Fox SNES game, as well as its follow-up, Star Fox 2. On the 3DS, they teamed up with Nintendo once more for Star Fox 64 3D, a remake of the classic N64 game. Q Games and Nintendo EAD co-developed it before it was released in 2011. According to Dylan Cuthbert, this isn't the only remake we could have seen from them on the 3DS. Shortly after production on Star Fox 64 3D wrapped, Q Games approached Nintendo once more and proposed remaking the original Star Fox. A playable prototype was made for the pitch, which is said to have boasted an enhanced frame rate and blocky retro 3D graphics to emulate the look of the original. Despite their enthusiasm about Star Fox 64 3D, Nintendo was not interested in moving forward with it. Speaking to Cuthbert in 2017, he shared that he wasn't sure why Nintendo Nintendo's higher-ups weren't interested in their pitch, but stated that Shigeru Miyamoto, who spearheaded the remake of 64, was absent during the demonstration, which could help to explain why. When I inquired if the 3DS demo could be shown to the world now, some years later, Cuthbert told me that it was probably gone forever. Next up is something a bit different, a rejected Nintendo pitch that still happened by other means. Plock is a 1993 platformer game that was developed by Software Creations for the Super Nintendo. The game revolved around the titular hero Plock, who could hurl his limbs at enemies to attack them. Plock was the company's first ever original IP to be wholly self-financed, however, it was very nearly a game that was published and co-developed by Nintendo themselves instead. Midway through development, Software Creations co-founder Richard Kay sent a demo of Plock to Nintendo. He had been searching for a publishing partner to distribute the game and saw Nintendo as a prime candidate. According to Kay, it was none other than Mario creator himself Shigeru Miyamoto who took a liking to Plock and believed it had potential. He is even said to have scribbled down a list on a piece of paper plotting out what he thought were the top three platformers around at the time. The number one spot belonged to Mario, Sega Sonic the Hedgehog came in at two, and Plock was in third, despite having only only been in development for a relatively short period of time. He then declared that, under his personal guidance, Plock could surpass Sonic in his estimation, although he didn't think it could dethrone Mario. Had a deal gone forward, Plock could have gone on to become one of Nintendo's next big characters. Miyamoto apparently saw them not only potentially publishing it, but sharing development duties with them in some capacity too. In the end, nothing ever came of these discussions. Nintendo for some reason lost interest in working with them on Plock. In an interview with Retro Gamer, Richard Case speculated that it might have been in part down to Nintendo working on Yoshi's Island around this time. He believes that the game shared similar features and visual elements, which could have possibly contributed to Nintendo backing away from Plock. They were still able to find another publisher, Trade West, and the game, though not hugely successful, earned itself a modest cult following. E3 2006 saw the reintroduction of Pit, the main protagonist of Kid Icarus, who appeared in a trailer for the next Super Smash Bros. game, Brawl. As a result of this, fan demand for a new Kid Icarus game surged. It had been over 15 years since the last one, of Myths and Monsters for the Game Boy. It would be a few more years before Nintendo would finally answer calls for the series to return, but ever since that first trailer dropped, they had been quietly reviewing options to make it happen. Over the years, former employees from various Nintendo studios have claimed that several different pitches existed for a Kid Icarus revival around this time. One of these came from one of Nintendo's biggest first-party subsidiaries, 
series, Retro Studios. In the early 2000s, they had been responsible for the Metroid Prime games, and now a few of their developers had turned their sights towards bringing back another series with Kid Icarus. According to former members of Retro, very few people seem to have been involved with the pitch, which was for a game on the Wii. It's said to have been presented sometime in mid-2007, meaning that it would have ended development later that year had it been accepted. At the time, the rest of the company was wrapping up on Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. The Kid Icarus pitch was headed by Jason Bear, a veteran game designer who worked on both Metroid Prime and its sequel, Echoes. Very little is said to have been done on the pitch, which apparently existed as nothing more than a few documents. Before anything more substantial like test animations or an early gameplay demo could be made, Nintendo dismissed the developing project outright. The reasoning behind this was how it went against Nintendo's key philosophies regarding game pitches. It was apparently presented to them mostly as the idea of reviving the IP and its characters, as opposed to offering a particularly unique or well-constructed core gameplay concept that would justify the game's existence. A closely held ideal of Nintendo's is their idea of putting gameplay first over all else. Narrative, visuals, characters, these are usually secondary to them. Retro's Kid Icarus concept failed to satisfy this criteria, and like many Nintendo pitches that have made this same mistake before it, it was swiftly shot down. By contrast, the Kid Icarus revival that was eventually made, Uprising, only came about when its director Masahiro Sakurai invented a gameplay concept first, before realising in retrospect that Kid Icarus would be a good fit for it. I reached out to Jason Bear in 2017 to see if he would be willing to give his thoughts on the Kid Icarus concept. He was not able to confirm or deny his involvement in the project, but shared that Kid Icarus had always been his favourite NES game growing up, and that its design continues to inspire him to this day. Did you know, one of Nintendo's most prestigious studios, Retro Studios, wanted to make a Final Fantasy Tactics-style Zelda game for the Nintendo DS, called Heroes of Hyrule. Retro pitched it to Nintendo in 2004, around the same time they were finishing up Metroid Prime 2, but Nintendo passed on the project, so the game got scrapped early on. Did you know gaming managed to get a hold of the full 22-page document from former Retro employees while researching the last Zelda video about their scrapped spin-off starring Sheik? Today, we're going to look at Heroes of Hyrule in its entirety. The gameplay, artwork, a story that sounds a little like Breath of the Wild, and some Retro Studios behind the scenes. Let's start at the beginning. Link is not the main character in Heroes of Hyrule, although he does make a surprise appearance as an NPC. After the cover and some artwork, the third page introduces the game's story. It says, 100 years ago, three heroes defeated an ancient evil and sealed it away in a magical book. For many ages, the people lived in peace and freedom, free of the scourge that had tormented them for so long. Until one day, when the book came into the hands of a young boy. A few pages later, there's a more detailed plot outline. Think of it like the prologue at the beginning of most Zelda games, describing events in the past. There's 16 pieces of art in the pitch, but we're going to add some of our own art to help visualise parts of the story that are only told through text. We'll make a note on screen so you know which ones were commissioned by Digino Gaming and which ones were made by Retro. <clears throat> 100 years ago, Ganon captured Princess Zelda, and Link ventured off to save her. But after an ambush, Link fell into the hands of Ganon's minions. Three of Link's friends, who were the titular heroes in Heroes of Hyrule, went on an adventure to rescue him. The three heroes were Dunar the Goron, Serif the Rito, and Krell the Zora. Dunar's a gruff, tough fighter who embodies the Triforce of Power. He's the strong, silent type, but with few words he reveals a surprisingly keen intellect. Seraph embodies the Triforce of Courage, and she's patient, helpful and warm-hearted, while also remarkably brave and fiercely loyal to her friends. She was the first to discover Link got kidnapped, and she was the one who got the heroes together to rescue him. And Krell embodies the Triforce of Wisdom. He's the brains of the party, sort of an arrogant and cynical wisecracker, but that's just an outer shell he uses to hide his soft insides. After many adventures, the heroes defeated Ganon and rescued Link. Then Ganon retreated into a magical spellbook called the Book of Ganon, which he'd previously created as a tool to enhance his evil power. 
After his defeat, Ganon's spirit got stuck inside the book in a weakened state, similar to how he was trapped in the spirit realm at the end of Ocarina of Time. The heroes tried to burn the book, but it wouldn't catch fire, so they ripped out a bunch of pages and scattered them all over Hyrule to make sure Ganon could never escape. Link took what was left of the book and hid it away for safekeeping. Then a hundred years passed. And that brings us to the present, where the game actually begins. The player takes control of a boy named Cory, who gets to know an old man who owns an antiques shop. One day, the old man has to leave town in a hurry, so he asks Cory to watch the shop while he's away. Eventually, Cory discovers a secret room in the shop where the Book of Ganon is hidden. He starts reading the book, which tells the events of a hundred years ago, the past, and that's where the tactical RPG elements come into play. Heroes of Hyrule is actually divided into two worlds. Two thirds of the game takes place in the past as tactics, and one third takes place in the present. In the present, you play as Cory with real-time exploration and role-playing, sort of a traditional Zelda experience, but without dungeons or combat. It's more about exploring the town and interacting with the people who live there. This design was written up in 2004, three years before Phantom Hourglass. It never mentions touch controls, so we assume Heroes of Hyrule would have used more traditional controls like the most recent handheld Zelda at the time, Minish Cap. According to the doc, Cory does tasks and favours for the town's residents, like delivering items, searching for hidden objects, digging for treasure, and trading sequences. There's also events and mini-games around town, like a fishing contest, kite flying contest, a scavenger hunt, and a music contest at the music hall. Cory does all these things to earn or discover lost pages of the Book of Ganon, which he doesn't realise is evil. He just wants to read more of the book's legends. After Cory gets a new page, he returns to the book, inserts the missing page, and it unlocks a new adventure in the past. According to the doc, when Cory discovers the book in the old man's antiquities shop, he literally brings the hero's adventures to life by reading the book, and he begins to relive their quests one by one. Now the game switches over to the three heroes a hundred years ago, and plays less like Zelda and more like Final Fantasy Tactics, but more puzzle focused. Dunar's the beefy tank who can lift heavy objects, he's got a hammer for melee attacks, a Deku medallion for summoning a fire spirit, a fire charm that makes all fire sources on the map explode, and a fire shield that makes him invulnerable to fire. Seraph's the fast archer who can fly and change the wind's direction. Her primary weapon's a boomerang that can hit multiple enemies or switches from a distance. She has an invisibility mask for sneaking past enemies, and fire and ice arrows for freezing and burning enemies and objects. And Krell's the long-distance spellcaster who can swim. He can use healing magic, protective magic, boost the party's stats, create tsunamis from anywhere there's water on a map, freeze or thaw bodies of water, and he's got the lens of truth for seeing invisible enemies and hidden doors. The heroes don't start with all of these items and abilities, though. They acquire them one by one over the course of the game. They can also obtain more common items that any of them can use, like bombs, deku seeds, and fairy jars. The heroes are occasionally joined by cameo characters from past Zelda games. The document doesn't name them, but we're going to assume there'd be personalities fans would like, such as Impa, Tingle, or Skull Kid. Some of the hero's items also allow them to summon new creatures, such as elementals of fire, water, earth, and air. Unlike other strategy RPGs, Heroes of Hyrule doesn't have experience points or a leveling up system. Instead, there's a heavier emphasis on item collection, like a normal Zelda. Quoting page 12, it's turn-based strategy and puzzle solving. The player controls the heroes and their occasional allies in a series of discrete encounters. Although most of these encounters will involve combat, much of the gameplay in the hero's world is oriented towards solving environmental puzzles in traditional Zelda fashion. Most of the items the heroes can employ have functions in environmental puzzle solving as well as combat. Each adventure isn't just a battle, though. You don't play through one page, then you're done and move on to the next one. Each page is more like an area of Hyrule you can return to later. 
Page 13 says, Each area is divided into several distinct sections, or phases, which are separated by environmental puzzles and obstacles. Much like in a Metroid game, these obstacles act as gates to limit the party's progress until they earn the items they need to overcome the obstacles and proceed to the next phase. This design encourages the player to revisit areas he has already explored in order to advance the hero's quest. The three-phase system would probably be easy to understand during gameplay, but might be a bit confusing as a wall of text, so before we break down how it's explained in the pitch, we'll try to simplify it with a comparison to Ocarina of Time. Let's say Kakariko Village and Death Mountain together are one area. You can enter Kakariko Village unrestricted, but there are some further areas you can't access right away. This is Phase 1. Later on, you get a letter from Zelda, which lets you open the gate in Kakariko that leads to Death Mountain. Death Mountain is Phase 2. In order to progress any further, you have to go to an entirely different area of Hyrule to learn Saria's song, then come back to Death Mountain and play it for Darunia to get the Goron's bracelet. Now, you can destroy the boulder to enter Dodongo's cavern, which is Phase 3. You've gradually gained access to all three phases of one big area each with its own environmental puzzles, enemies, heart pieces, etc. In this game, that's one page in the Book of Ganon. One adventure. Okay, now here's how it works in Heroes of Hyrule. The pitch doc shows artwork for a sample area, and a step-by-step -step description for how one adventure plays out. The areas on the map marked 1, 2, 3 are all Phase 1. Dunar uses the Goron gauntlets to move a boulder, which reveals a hidden tunnel underneath. The heroes go through the tunnel and into a nearby tower where they pull a lever to lower the drawbridge. They cross the drawbridge and into the courtyard and fight some enemies. That's the end of Phase 1. There are certain items you need to access Phase 2. The areas on the map marked 4, 5, 6. Seraph has to use the wind charm to make the wind blow north, then she flies over the moat while the other two float across with Deku leaves. Once across the moat, there's more enemies to fight, then Dunar throws a boulder to break a wall, providing an entrance into the castle proper. Inside, they fight a wizard, then Krell uses his ocarina to bring a statue to life. It gives them the invisibility mask to sneak past some enemies in a different adventure to obtain the fire shield. They then come back here with the fire shield for phase 3, which is a boss battle against a fire giant. After beating the boss, the adventure's complete. Cory collecting pages in the present unlocks new adventures for the heroes in the past, and the reverse is true as well. The pitch says, Completing adventures and battles in the hero's world rewards Cory with new knowledge that he can use to unlock new parts of his own world. For example, the heroes speak to a great Deku tree. Cory later recognizes it as the tree in the center of his own town's commons, and he can now speak to it, although it's a hundred years older. Or, after Cory reads about the heroes playing an ocarina melody in the past, he can then use the same melody to win a music contest. There are other items to collect besides just the pages themselves. Many of the book's pages have item-shaped outlines, and by finding items that fit into them, Cory can give the heroes extra health, magic, and so on. The heroes can also find special items, like heart pieces, to permanently boost their max health and magic. There's also equipment to find, like armor, shields, and weapons to raise their other stats, like strength, defense, and movement speed. Clearly, the designers were trying to make a unique hybrid, marrying elements of a classic Zelda title with Final Fantasy tactics. The document's pretty explicit about that fact, saying, quote, Heroes of Hyrule is a story-driven game of exploration, puzzle-solving, and strategic combat in the Zelda universe. Designed for the Nintendo DS, Heroes of Hyrule will appeal to fans of games such as the previous Zelda titles and Final Fantasy Tactics. Why do this? Heroes of Hyrule expands the rich Zelda universe with new characters, storylines, and play mechanics. It also injects exciting new themes into the proven, handheld strategic RPG market segment, ultimately providing a product worthy of the Nintendo name. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance came out on GBA a year earlier, garnering high review scores and going on to become the 22nd best-selling GBA game of all time, right up there with the Minish Cap and Metroid Fusion. 
and it seems Retro Studios wanted a piece of that pie. Did you know Gaming spoke to one team member who was willing to go on record? Paul Tozer. You might remember him from the recent video about Retro's other Zelda project. I feel the statute of limitations has expired on a lot of this because it's 15 years ago, and I'm interested in telling the truth. In 2004, Retro had just finished Metroid Prime 2, but they didn't really want to be a studio that only makes one series. Some of them were getting a little burnt out on Metroid, and it's a little risky having all your eggs in one basket. Paul said, Retro's senior producer Brian Walker was always pushing, like, what's our DS side project gonna be? And he somehow pegged me as the guy who was gonna lead the engineering effort on Retro's first Nintendo DS game. Paul's a big tactics fan and has some experience designing strategy games, so he came up with an idea called RPG Tactics and pitched it to Retro's higher-ups, but it didn't gain traction. However, Mark Pacini took the opportunity to pitch a new concept. If that name rings a bell, it's probably because Mark Pacini was the lead designer on Metroid Prime, and the director of Prime 2 and 3. Paul said, Mark took a look at that and then said, hey, let's make a different kind of tactics game in the Zelda universe. So from my initial idea of RPG tactics, it evolved into a game that was much more of a puzzle RPG adventure game. When you've got these three heroes, plus the young boy, and you've got to figure out how do I use the abilities of these four different characters to get past lots of different obstacles. It turned into a totally different game. It no longer had any resemblance to RPG tactics. That was just sort of the spark that got this whole thing going. But Mark and I worked together, and I wrote up most of these documents. This was more adventures and puzzles than tactics and RPG, because that's the direction Mark really wanted to take it. Three years after all of this happened, Tactics Advance got a sequel on Nintendo DS, which again was well received, though not quite as well as its predecessor. If Heroes of Hyrule had made it into full production, it probably would have beaten Final Fantasy to market, and gotten a sales boost thanks to that Zelda connection. According to the document, Heroes of Hyrule would have differentiated itself from other tactics games with four key features. The focus on item collection over experience points, interactive environments, the back and forth gameplay where events in the past and present unlock new possibilities in the other, and the mini-games like fishing and interacting with the town's NPCs. Mark and Paul worked on the project, along with Retro's in-house translator, and an artist whose name Paul unfortunately can't remember after all these years. Did you know Gaming has reached out to Mark on several occasions, but he wasn't interested in talking about old projects. Did you know Gaming also reached out to all of Retro's artists, but the ones who would talk couldn't remember which artist worked on Heroes of Hyrule. The copy we got our hands on only has a few phrases in Japanese, but Paul remembers physical booklets that were fully translated into Japanese so that they could pitch it to Nintendo. Unfortunately, they passed on the project. Paul said, We sent it over to Nintendo SPD and got an immediate, No, you're not doing that. To this day, I do not know why. They just didn't seem to have any interest in that gameplay concept, which is too bad. It was a really solid concept and had the potential to be something great. Unlike the Sheik spin-off Digino you know Gaming covered in the last video, a playable prototype was never developed for Heroes of Hyrule. That would have required the green light from Nintendo. So all that's left of Heroes of Hyrule is this pitch document. It's worth noting that one of the meeting rooms at Retro Studios is literally called The Lost Woods. A lot of fans wonder what goes on inside Retro. It's a pretty secretive company, perhaps even more secretive than Nintendo. So we'll lay out their Zelda timeline. They worked on Heroes of Hyrule for about a month and pitched it to Nintendo in May 2004, right around the same time they were finishing up on Metroid Prime 2. Some former retro guys told Digino you know Gaming a lot of the staff were kind of burnt out on Metroid at this point, and wanted to move on to a new series. But Satoru Iwata asked them to make one more Metroid to finish up the trilogy, and show the world how great first-person shooting could work with the Wii Pointer controls. We're not saying that's why Heroes of Hyrule was rejected. Retro could have made both games, but the point is, franchise fatigue was even worse as they were finishing up Prime 3. That's when Retro spent nine months programming a chic prototype for the Wii, but Nintendo rejected that pitch too. 
A week or two later, Retro Leadership announced that the next game wasn't going to be Zelda, it was going to be Donkey Kong. Paul told Digino Gaming, Leadership basically got us in that big meeting room, sat down and said, our next game is going to be bringing back the Donkey Kong Country franchise, and that's what we're doing. I'm not going to hear any objections. The decision is final. And I can't blame them for wanting to make that, because I think they spent a lot less to make Donkey Kong than any of the Metroid games, and probably made two or three times more profit. So I can't blame them from a financial perspective. Paul was really only interested in making Metroid and Zelda games though, so he resigned a few days later. Quite a few other Retro Studios members left around the same time. That's the end of Retro's story, at least as far as Zelda's concerned. But what about the game's story? According to the documents, over the course of the game, Corey gradually collects the missing pages scattered around town, not realising the consequences of doing so. When he inserts the final page, Ganon comes back to life. Ganon's about to kill Corey, but at the last second, the three heroes come out of the book as well, and the four of them fight against Ganon in an epic final battle. After the dust settles, the old man who owns the antiquities shop returns from his trip, accompanied by three elderly friends, a Goron, a Rito, and a Zora. Cory immediately recognises them as the three heroes from the book, and if you hadn't figured it out yet, surprise, it's revealed that the old man was actually Link all along. Did you know? Before making the critically acclaimed Grand Theft Auto series, Rockstar North was developing games for Nintendo. In the early 90s, Rockstar, then known as DMA Design, was one of Nintendo's top second-party developers, making titles for the Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64. Among these games was a top-secret project starring one of Nintendo's most recognizable characters. Intended to release on the SNES in 1995, Kid Kirby was a spin-off where players follow Kirby in his first adventure through Dreamland. The game was intended for an even younger audience than Kirby, somehow, and was in production for years, constantly switching its style and staff. Although relatively far in development, the game was cancelled by Nintendo for various reasons, and DMA moved on to other projects, eventually parting ways with Nintendo altogether. Despite being part of such an iconic series, there is very little documentation on Kid Kirby Online. ROMs of the game have yet to surface, and the only direct coverage of Kid Kirby in the press was a tiny blurb in a Mexican magazine. So today we'll be discussing the game in its entirety, how it got made, why it was scrapped, and how it may have had an impact on DMA's future titles. Did You Know Gaming has managed to get a hold of several ex-DMA developers involved in the project, and they gave us some valuable insight. Unfortunately, however, none of them have kept any form of ROM, source code, or artwork from the project. So, to help illustrate the game's visuals, we're working with professional game artist Sean Hicks to recreate what could have been, creating accurate mock-ups based on the developer's descriptions. And we'll credit this in the corner so you know what we commissioned and what's from the actual game. Through extensive interviews and hours of internet sleuthing, here is the story of Kid Kirby, the lost Nintendo game from the twisted minds of GTA. Before we go any further, we should explain where Rockstar North, and by extension, DMA Design, came from. Once you know the roots, Rockstar developing a Kirby game isn't as crazy as it sounds. DMA Design officially began in 1987 in a two-room office above a baby supply shop in Scotland. Founder Dave Jones, a gifted electronics engineer from the city of Dundee, was interested in computing since the late 70s. According to Jones, there was only one computer in his entire school, and he spent as much time as possible on it, much to the dismay of his teachers. However, by the early 80s, home computers became much more accessible in Europe with the rise of systems like the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64. Jones often hung out at the Dundee Computer Club, where he'd meet three other programmers, Mike Daly, Steve Hammond, and Russell Kay. The four became good friends and began designing small games for 8-bit computers. After losing his job at a manufacturing plant right out of high school, Jones used his 3,000 pound severance package, about 15,000 USD in today's money, to buy a state-of-the-art Amiga computer. He began working on his first big game, Menace. A fast-paced arcade shooter, Menace was released by major British publisher Psygnosis in 1988. Before finishing the game, Jones sought to create an actual studio after realizing literally none existed in Dundee. The name he settled on, DMA Design, was taken from Amiga programming manuals, where it stood for Direct Memory Access. In Jones's case, it meant Direct Mind Access, though over time, DMA would eventually come to mean doesn't mean anything. Jones quickly began employing his friends from the computer club, and DMA's second title, a spiritual successor to Menace called Blood Money, would release in 1989. 
Money started to pool into the tiny studio, and Jones dropped out of university to concentrate on DMA full-time. DMA's first major success came not from another space shooter, but a cutesy puzzle strategy game for the Amiga. Lemmings, released in February 1991, had the player guide a gaggle of anthropomorphic lemmings through a series of dangerous caverns. To complete a level, the player must give each lemming, which are constantly moving around the stage, a specific task that will help them avoid any upcoming obstacles. The lemmings can dig, build a staircase, climb walls, and if push comes to shove, self-destruct. Lemmings was a smash hit, selling 55,000 copies in its first day, and opening the gates for dozens of ports. DMA earned more than 1.5 million pounds from the game, about 5 million USD in today's money. And Jones, then only 25 years old, was becoming one of the wealthiest game designers in Europe. The crazy success of Lemmings eventually caught the eye of Nintendo, who wanted to give Jones and his company the contract of a lifetime. While the Nintendo 64, then codenamed Project Reality, was on the horizon, Nintendo started what was known as the Dream Team. In early 1994, they signed several developers and publishers outside of Japan for the 64's launch in North America. Some studios attached included Silicon Graphics, Acclaim, Williams, and Rare. DMA Design, now housing about 36 employees in a swanky upgraded office, was announced as part of the Dream Team on May 2nd. Months prior, DMA went to Nintendo at a trade show, presenting them with something thought impossible. Using a clip from Star Wars, the company proved that full-screen video compression was possible on the SNES. The demo impressed Nintendo so much that they invested hugely in DMA, giving them tons of equipment like a $34,000 silicon graphics machine. Nintendo was also impressed with their work on home computers, and particularly their creative decisions in game design. Lemmings, a family-friendly, cartoony, gameplay-rich title, is exactly the kind of game Nintendo likes. We think Dave Jones is one of the very few people in the world that are in the Spielberg category. Howard Lincoln, then chairman at Nintendo of America, told the press, his software ideas are incredible. DMA signed a multi-million pound contract to develop two games for the Nintendo 64. The studio also began doing titles for the Super Nintendo. And because of their newfound relationship, DMA decided to reskin a rudimentary SNES game with an original IP into one with a recognizable Nintendo character. The small Scottish studio would become the first developer outside of Japan to work on the Kirby franchise. This was the beginning of Kid Kirby. In the 80s and 90s, there was a trend of taking older, established franchises and babifying the characters for a younger audience. If you lived during this time, you might remember things like Tiny Toon Adventures, Muppet Babies, and Nintendo's own Baby Mario in Yoshi's Island. Kid Kirby would not be dissimilar to these spin-offs. The game's plot is told from the perspective of an older Kirby who is retelling the story of his first adventure. We open on the DMA logo embossed into the cover of Kirby's storybook. The book opens up, revealing a title card and the opening cutscene. We see Baby Kirby, prominently featured with a long, curly string of hair on his head, waking up from his crib in the middle of the night. He hears a strange noise outside and goes to investigate. He discovers that the Star Rod, the item that keeps Dreamland alive, has gone missing. So now it's up to Kirby to find the magical wand and save the day. Were it to be released, Kid Kirby would have been one of the unique titles compatible with the SNES mouse. Bundled initially with Mario Paint, the mouse was mostly used for puzzle games, art software, and simulations. So it was rare for a platformer to have this kind of peripheral support. In Kid Kirby, the mouse controls a large cartoon glove, serving as a boost for Baby Kirby. Holding the left button, you can pull back Kirby's hair and slingshot him across the level. The further you pulled back, the further Kirby would fly. Think of it as an early version of Angry Birds. When Kirby is mid-air, you can either slap him higher up, essentially doing a double jump, or slam him toward the ground onto the enemies below. Of course, a Kirby game would not be complete without copy abilities. Tapping the right button would activate a power-up obtained from an enemy you recently killed. The stone power, previously seen in Kirby's adventure, would return in this game, allowing Kirby to turn into a rock and crush his enemies with his weight. There were also plenty of original ideas for power-ups. Kirby could turn into a paper airplane and glide across the level. He could even put on a pair of sticky shoes and stick himself to a wall. Kirby is similar to the titular characters in Lemmings, constantly moving around with a mind of his own. The player essentially serves as a babysitter, a literal helping hand keeping Kirby out of trouble. The goal of Kid Kirby is to collect the lost stars scattered across each world. Once you collect them all, you throw Kirby through a hoop and progress to the next level. There was also an option for a two-player mode, where the screen is split in half and two players race side by side. Kid Kirby consisted of 120 levels, about 60 of which formed the main body of the game. The remaining 60 could be accessed via a hidden door on one of the levels. According to programmer James Watson, who shared his memories of the game in a 2008 forum post, the door was hidden within a large bell. Fun fact, finishing each level would add 1% to the completion counter, and a perfect score required you to beat the game by 120%.
Most of the classic bosses from the franchise would return here. Wispy Woods, as always, would be the first boss. King DDD, now a mere prince, would serve as the main antagonist. Enemies included Waddle Dees, Waddle Doos, and Bronto Burt. In researching this video, we contacted one of the many artists who worked at DMA in the mid-90s. This person, who chose to remain anonymous, was one of the original artists on Kid Kirby, where they helped design 3D renders of the enemies and bosses. As well as Wispy Woods, they modeled a Buckethead boss and a Sea Anemone boss. Whether these bosses were original creations by DMA or pre-existing concepts sent over by Nintendo is unknown. After talking to some Kirby experts, we weren't able to find any similar bosses, and the artist, unfortunately, has no memory of what the boss's actual names were. Before working on Kid Kirby, the developers at DMA had a mixed relationship with the Pink Puffball. Some people, like our anonymous artist, were well aware of the franchise, being fans of titles like Kirby's Dream Course and the original Dreamland. Others were the opposite. Programmer Patrick Kerr, who joined the project in May 1995, was initially unaware that Kirby was an existing IP. I hadn't owned any Nintendo stuff because you couldn't program it. I had come from a home computing background and didn't even know what Kirby was when I started. Looking to learn more about the franchise, Steve Hammond, one of the original DMA employees, contacted Nintendo of America for some background information. In return, he received a Monster Facts, which contained character sheets and manuals from previous games. This let Hammond develop a massive internal document called the Unofficial Kirby Reference Book for Westerners. It was a helpful resource for both himself and other DMA employees. Hammond was tasked with writing the game's manual, which laid out the story in a compelling yet humorous manner. The manual was littered with Hammond's own sketches of Kirby, who spoke in an alien language that could only be read as pieces of fruit. This was a reference to classic Marvel comics, where the writers would translate indecipherable languages for the reader's sake. It should be noted that production on Kid Kirby was happening during a hectic time at DMA. Numerous projects across different consoles were concurrently ongoing, and each team consisted of less than 10 core people, often working on several projects at a time. Jones's idea was to try different things, knowing that hits were rare but highly valuable when achieved. At the same time as Kirby, the studio was focused on developing two games for the N64, one of which, Body Harvest, was originally intended as a launch title and was a top priority to Nintendo. Shigeru Miyamoto would often visit the offices in Dundee to consult on various projects. Although Body Harvest was his main concern, Miyamoto always made time for Kirby. He had witnessed an earlier iteration of the game and wanted to add more richness to its playability. Pat Kerr recalls that the power-ups, the paper airplane, the rock, and the sticky shoes may have been Miyamoto's suggestions, though we could not fully confirm this. Nintendo of America had some input as well. The original Prince DDD design was one of the things faxed over to Steve Hammond, hence why it looks so, uh, different compared to the other renders. I don't think any of our guys would have put out something that ugly. In an interview with Next Generation Magazine, Jones described DMA's relationship with Nintendo. It's fine. It's hard. It's a very hard relationship because their quality is so high that it's so hard to match the quality of the products they do. And they really want you to focus on making Nintendo products. It's very hard to write games that you're not writing for yourself, which is traditionally what I've done. I write a game because I want to play it. It's a big, big difference when you try and write a game for somebody else. It's really, really hard to do. Kid Kirby was scheduled for release around October 1995, but was in development as far back as 1993. It should be made clear that the Kirby license wasn't always attached. The initial concept came from Tony Colgan, a freelance programmer who previously worked for DMA in the late 80s. Colgan's original pitch was a golf game, the idea being that you could pull the mouse back and strike the ball, shooting through any obstacles that may exist in a two-dimensional plane. Colgan presented Jones with a prototype and was quickly offered a full-time job at the company. It was decided early on that the golf theme should be scrapped and replaced with something more creative, something more DMA. The game had been renamed Jellies. This version had the player control a gelatinous blob with a mind of its own. The goal was to stretch the jelly out and ping them off in any direction, forcing them to land on a series of platforms and escape the level. Bugaboo, The Flea, a ZX Spectrum game from 1983, was a major influence in its design. As part of the early Dream Team negotiations in February 1994, Jellies got exposed to Nintendo, who thought the game would be a good addition to the Kirby franchise, and DMA agreed. The biggest changes afterwards were its visuals. Early on, the game had a more flat aesthetic, with levels built out of large, single-colored blocks. Kirby was initially a tiny 16x16 sprite, but his size grew as the game progressed. At a certain point, Kirby and all the enemies and bosses were redesigned with pre-rendered graphics, and the levels were changed to have a pseudo-3D feel. This change likely happened following the release of Donkey Kong Country, which used pre-rendered graphics on the SNES in a similar manner. In 2007, Mike Daly, another Day One DMA employee, released several Kid Kirby maps and sprites onto his personal Flickr account. The post has since been removed, but is still easily accessible online. 
The maps give us a good idea as to what kind of levels would have been in the game. There's a cavern, a castle, and a possible boss battle at the Fountain of Dreams. There's also a factory stage with moving girders, as well as a snow level where you'd push through ice blocks to get to the finish. Speaking with Pat Kerr, we confirmed that most of this art was used in the earlier 2D iterations and does not represent the final product. Only two maps, Tube 9 and Sewer 9, would have been included in the pseudo 3D versions. These were the backgrounds we chose to use in our mock-ups. As the first people outside of Japan to lead production on a Kirby game, the developers had a lot of responsibility. The staff consisted of about five programmers, three artists, and a single musician. After going through several changes, the game was nearly finished by early 1996. Unfortunately, various complications prevented the game from hitting store shelves. Due to the nature of the controls, Kid Kirby ideally would have been packaged with the SNES mouse. However, due to the SNES nearing the end of its life cycle, it was decided the game should be cancelled. Increasingly poor sales of the mouse meant it'd be too expensive to consider releasing. Had it been completed earlier, it could have seen the light of day, but development went much slower than intended, repeatedly being delayed. Things like the basic collision system were far behind schedule, and with so many projects underway, DMA producers didn't have much time to consult. For many people, Kid Kirby was their first professional project. Some programmers and artists were right out of university and lacked the experience that could have pushed the game forward. Tony Colgan, essentially Kid Kirby's director, would be let go near the end of development. This meant it was up to Pat Kerr and programmer Stuart Hunt to complete any unfinished business. Still, nothing could be secured. After years of work, Nintendo eventually got tired of the lack of progress, as did their QA department, and decided to scrap the project entirely in 1996. Kid Kirby was no more. I think the game actually looked fairly nice in its way, but it was just a simple for the kids thing. Probably wasn't taken very seriously by the company, but I was too young and naive to understand that. Shortly after, Nintendo cut ties with DMA. Various complications with Body Harvest, the planned to be launched title for the N64, caused Nintendo to drop the project, leaving DMA to find a new publisher. With one project cancelled and another not up to snuff, Nintendo had no reason to pursue further projects with DMA. There is a happy ending to this story, though. While some of the projects DMA was working on in the mid-90s went unreleased and others were flops, some did end up being surprise smash hits. Various members of the Kid Kirby team, like Pat Kerr and composer Colin Anderson, among others, jumped ship to work on another project, a little game called Grand Theft Auto. Mike Daly and Russell Kay have even named Pat Kerr a crucial figure in GTA's success, attributing the game's appeal to his exceptional vehicle physics, which gave it the fun it was severely lacking. The original Grand Theft Auto would release on the PC in November of 1997. Its success was a shock to many employees who viewed it as a troubled project akin to Kid Kirby. It was the start of a new era for the company. Take-Two Interactive acquired BMG, the publisher of GTA and Body Harvest, in March 1998. As a result, several Take-Two employees transitioned to a newly established subsidiary called Rockstar Games. While key personnel such as Jones, Daly, and Hammond departed, the DMA name endured. Under new management, they continued developing games, starting with GTA 3 in October 2001. Subsequently, in May 2002, the company underwent a name change to Rockstar North, a name that has remained unchanged to this day. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that Kid Kirby played a noteworthy part in Rockstar's history, as its cancellation opened the door for many of the original staff on Grand Theft Auto. DMA was going through a chaotic time in the 90s, and it was through this chaos that concepts like GTA could get off the ground. So next time you're playing GTA, running over civilians and gunning down officers, thank Kirby for making it possible. More specifically, thank Kid Kirby, the cutest pink puffball Dreamland never saw. As of the writing of this video, a playable copy has yet to be discovered. Of all of the people we reached out to for today's video, none managed to keep anything from their time at DMA, as they simply didn't have the means to save their work then. Mike Daly claims to have a demo stored in his archives, but he himself admits it has since vanished. The images from Daly's Flickr account, as well as the rough copies of Steve Hammond's manual, are currently all that survive. But who knows? Maybe one day a prototype will emerge from the archives of Rockstar North, or be found hidden away in a Nintendo employee's closet. Considering the high-profile stuff on Earth in the last few years, it's entirely plausible. Only time will tell. Did you know? In 2013, there was an internal pitch at Retro Studios proposing that after Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, their next project should be a Star Fox game. Unfortunately though, it got shot down by Retro's leadership, so the game never got made. The project has never been talked about publicly until now, and it would have been called Star Fox Armada. So in today's video, we're taking a look at what the game would have been if it got the green light. Did you know gaming staff recently talked to Eric Kozlowski, a former Retro Studios artist who spent 20 years in the industry, working on games like Uncharted, Mass Effect, 
And of course, Donkey Kong. Eric's the guy that came up with the Star Fox concept, and he gave us the full 12-page pitch document and told us all about the game he wanted to make. The game was aimed at Wii U, and the art style would have emulated the puppet aesthetic that was seen in the series' early promotional images. The Wii U couldn't compete with the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One in terms of lifelike graphics, but it could produce a believable puppet look that would have had a unique charm that you wouldn't find anywhere else. You know, it's like, it makes sense, like retro, like we, you know, at the time rebooted Prime and then we rebooted uh, Kong Country. And I was like, yeah, we could reboot another Nintendo franchise. Like, I thought it would be really cool after Tropical Freeze to, to roll off onto another franchise and kind of like continue that retro legacy of rebooting Nintendo franchises that hadn't gotten a lot of love. Star Fox has taken a lot of forms over the years. The more traditional games were on-rail space shooters, while some later entries veered off into other genres, like how Star Fox Adventures was more action-adventure, and Star Fox Command had real-time strategy. But the series was at its height both critically and commercially with Star Fox 64, so Armada was going to continue where that game ended, both in terms of story and gameplay. And, very importantly, Fox never gets out of his ship like he did in later games. Quoting the pitch doc directly, it says, Picking up where Star Fox 64 leaves off, Star Fox Armada is essentially a reboot as if no games have been made since. After the defeat of Andros, General Pepper realizes that Corneria and the Lilat system at large need to be rebuilt. However, the war with Andros has left the Cornerian government with the lack of resources needed to rebuild the military and civilian sectors. Rather than send its meager military out and leave the Lilat system vulnerable, Pepper hires Star Fox once again. Their mission? Search nearby systems for allies and resources. Along the way, though, Fox and his crew will discover a threat far greater than Andros ever was. Going into more detail on the gameplay, the doc says, quote, Star Fox Armada will combine the classic gameplay of Star Fox 64 with new open world and multiplayer mechanics. In single player mode, players accept missions aboard the Great Fox and travel to planets, sectors, installations, and asteroid belts to complete them. As you finish missions, you will receive money that can either be sent back to Corneria or used to upgrade your ships, or even buy new ones like the Landmaster Tank and Blue Marine Submarine. After each mission, the player will have to decide on how many resources to send back to aid in Corneria's reconstruction, and how much to keep for themselves to spend on upgrading the Great Fox, the R-Wings, buying vehicles, and recruiting new characters. As great as Star Fox 64 was back in the 90s, a full playthrough only lasted an hour, which probably wouldn't fly with gamers in the Wii U era. So in addition to the main campaign, Armada is going to have optional side quest missions. Eric told us that these missions would have leaned more into the mercenary angle. Star Fox have always been mercenaries, but previous games didn't really focus on that detail. Overall, Armada would have had less of a linear structure like the old games, and expanded into more of a mission-based structure. We said earlier that Fox never gets out of his ship, the only exception is inside the Great Fox, where he can walk around in the various decks in what amounts to an interactive menu. Eric compared it to how the Normandy works in Mass Effect, where you can select missions, interact with the crew, and purchase upgrades. As for the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, it did all take place on a TV, while the Wii U gamepad emulated the ship's control panel, like showing you information about the current mission and which parts of your ship have been damaged by enemy attacks. If a wing or something's taken too many hits, the player needs to tap icons on the gamepad screen to repair it in real time. In other words, you wouldn't have to constantly look down to aim like you do in Star Fox Zero. If you want to play co-op, player one would use a Wii remote and nunchuck, and player two would use the gamepad, serving as the ship's gunner with a 360 degree view. They'd also handle repairs on the control ship's shields. For example, if a bunch of enemies fly from the left, player 2 would move the shields to that side and start gunning in that direction. If that style of gameplay wasn't to your liking, you could also play online with one friend or a group to complete missions with multiple ships. There also would have been a battle mode where you could have dogfights with your friends. Pretty much the same thing as versus mode in Star Fox 64, but instead of a split screen, it'd be a lot of ships flying around online. The reason the game is called quote-unquote Armada is because it encourages you to build up your own squadron. You and a bunch of your friends can make your own team and call it Starhawk, Star Snakes, Star Dogs, whatever you want. It's your team after all. You'd also have the option of designing your own anthropomorphic characters if you didn't want to play as Fox and crew. There was another, more innovative aspect planned for the online multiplayer. In Star Fox 64, sometimes when you're in the middle of a mission, Star Wolf would show up and attack you. Jeez. Can anyone take care of it? Can't let you do that. That would also happen in Star Fox Armada, except it was going to be the other online players dropping down on you. 
Fans who just wanted to focus on the core single player experience could just turn this off in the options. But for everyone else, enemy mercenaries showing up and obliterating you is something that would happen from time to time. Talking more about it, Eric said, You and your friends have your own team of like Star Lion, you know, and you, you're a lion character and, you know, you could go on multiplayer missions and, and stuff like that. And I was thinking about the, the Miiverse of like, you know, you could say, oh man, Star Llama came in and took me out. I'm putting up a bounty. If anyone sees Star Llama, you know, like, I'll pay them 500 credits in game, you know, uh, to take them out. And I thought that would be like a fun like Miiverse integration because like Miiverse at the time was, was really cool and there was a lot of opportunity there. Star Fox games haven't sold too well since the N64 days, so a big part of this pitch was selling management on Armada's financial prospects. All the online features were one of the main selling points to keep fans playing after they've already finished the main campaign. The pitch doc calls this an evergreen title, and also mentions DLC, which was intended to bring fans back for more by adding new ships, missions, and planets over time. Nintendo didn't really have any evergreen titles in 2013, but Splatoon sort of filled that niche when it released a couple years later, and it's been incredibly successful ever since. The doc says, quote, Star Fox has a great legacy, but it can be so much more. This can be Nintendo's very own Star Wars. It's Team Fortress 2, in regards to the online community. With the proper updates to the gameplay, Star Fox is poised to stand shoulder to shoulder with Mario and Link. In an alternate timeline, maybe Nintendo's premier online game could have been Star Fox instead of Splatoon. Or of course, you know, no, there's no reason both series couldn't have lived side by side. So why didn't Star Fox Armada get made? Eric pitched a document to Retro Leadership in January 2013. They basically said, oh, cool, and then passed on it. And it doesn't appear it's ever made its way up the chain to Nintendo. Eric told us Retro's leadership and Nintendo producer Kensuke Tanabe would ultimately decide on what the best direction is to go for the studio. I'm sure they were talking with Nintendo of Japan about what makes sense for the studio to work on based on personnel, Nintendo's portfolio of games in development at the time, and what the studio staff wants to work on at the time factors into it a bit. But ultimately, a lot of those decisions came from Japan. Eric ended up resigning from Retro a year and a half later, partly because of the studio's top-down nature. Other studios he's worked on had cultures that were more open, where pitches stand a chance of being turned into actual games. When we talked to Eric, he emphasized that this was a skeleton of a document, which would have needed fleshing out from all the brilliant people at Retro. Unfortunately though, internal pitches just never got approved at the studio. We heard similar sentiments from other former Retro employees. Check out the recent video on Metroid Tactics, for example. Fortunately for Eric, though, he's since moved on to greener pastures, where things aren't so higher acryl, worked on properties like Resident Evil. As of this video's publication, Retro Studios hasn't released a single game since Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze back in 2014. So after rejecting the Star Fox Armada pitch, what did they work on instead? Eric wouldn't say. After Tropical Freeze, Eric spent a year and a half working on a game that was never released, and that's all he was willing to divulge. Whatever Retro was making, it's still considered top secret. As for what happened to Star Fox, Nintendo later teamed up with Platinum Games to make Star Fox Zero, which unfortunately ended up as the worst selling game in the entire franchise. This was eight years ago, and there hasn't been another Star Fox game since. Fans are still waiting for the day that Fox will make his triumphant return, whether it's a reboot from Retro, or maybe Maybe in house at Nintendo, hopefully that day isn't too far off. Pilot Wings, Nintendo's amateur flight simulator franchise, lay dormant for around 15 years after its 1996 installment on the Nintendo 64. It finally re emerged at the launch of the Nintendo 3DS in 2011, breaking its extended hiatus with Pilot Wings Resort. However, throughout the 2000s, we almost saw the series return on multiple separate occasions across two generations of Nintendo hardware. The first of these came close to happening on the GameCube in around 2003. Nintendo had been in talks with Turrican and Star Wars Rogue Squadron developers Factor 5 to bring an alternative take on the series. It was intended to be done sometime after the development of Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike and was even teased by then CEO of Nintendo Satoru Iwata at E3 2003. Julian Egbrecht, the president of Factor 5 Inc was directing the project, envisioning a pilot wing set in the real world during the height of the Cold War. It was supposed to have the player train as a pilot in its initial stages before being recruited to carry out top secret missions for the military using various aircraft. Vastly different in theme and tone from any previous entry in the series, Pilot Wings for GameCube was inspired by some of Eggbrecht's favourite films, namely The Right Stuff from 1983, a movie which revolved around the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Despite both Factor 5 and Nintendo being enthusiastic about the game's potential, it was ultimately prevented from moving forward. Factor 5's main partner and benefactor was LucasArts, who had worked with them closely 
mostly on the Star Wars Rogue Squadron games. With them, they had produced both Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 and 3 as GameCube exclusives. While Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 was a huge success at the launch of the system, its follow-up didn't perform nearly as well, much to the dismay of LucasArts. Blaming the GameCube's lackluster sales, they began putting pressure on Factor 5 to end their exclusive relationship with Nintendo and start porting the Star Wars titles to the Xbox, a console with a larger install base. Factor 5 eventually succumbed to their demands, starting development on a collection of the Rogue Squadron games for the Xbox and taking their ideas for the Pilot Wings project with them. In the end, the Cold War Flight project that was originally supposed to be a Pilot Wings reboot never came together, and neither did their Xbox port of the Rogue Squadron games for that matter, which was shut down at around 50% completion in 2004. Around three to four years after the GameCube Pilot Wings fizzled out, Factor 5 had since been through a succession of rocky partnerships with Microsoft and Sony. Julian Egbrecht and his associates had been wanting to try their hand at creating games for the Nintendo Wii. When their collaboration with Sony met a premature end, they immediately jumped into Wii development in August 2007. Nintendo, who had since remained friendly with them, was pleased to have them back on board. Factor 5 began putting together pitches to work on a couple of first-party Nintendo properties as potential Wii exclusives. One of these, being made by a team of developers under Eggbrecht's close supervision, was their revised spin on Pilot Wings. On the Wii, they adopted a very different approach to the series. As opposed to the dark, Cold War affair they had once suggested, they went for something lighter and more marketable to the Wii's audience. Its art style was particularly reminiscent of the Wii Sports airplane demo that was shown at E3 2006. In comparison with their previous attempt on the GameCube, it was much more oriented towards casual play Players, but that's not to say the project was any smaller on ambition. On the contrary, had it been made, it would have been by far the largest Pilot Wings game to date, with a wealth of content laid out. The game would have operated as one massive open world based loosely around planet Earth. Players would have set off to explore it in various aircraft, flying over and completing missions around iconic real-life landmarks. The pitch's largest innovation, however, was its use of a brand new peripheral Factor 5 a design. They had entered talks with Nintendo for them to produce it as an officially licensed Nintendo Wii accessory. This was a pair of glasses to be worn by the user that were capable of tracking head movement. Former staff say it was inspired by an experiment devised by computer scientist Johnny Chung Lee. In 2007, he released a video showing a homemade setup of his involving a pair of glasses with infrared LEDs attached. Using the infrared camera in the Wii remote by placing it in front of a television, he used it to track the position and movement of the lights mounted on the glass. Utilised in tandem with a computer program displayed on a TV, this produced a 3D effect for the wearer. It could also allow the user to explore more of the environment displayed on the TV by simply turning their head and adjusting their position. Factor 5 developed their own version of the head tracking technology to work directly with the Wii using essentially the same principles, headgear emitting two sources of infrared light that the Wii could track. I spoke with Julian Egbrecht who shed more light on this aspect of the project. According to Julian and his developers created their own early prototypes for the glasses peripheral to sell the idea to Nintendo, which were made using parts from dismantled Wii sensor bars. They were able to implement their glasses prototype into two of the games they had in the works at the time, their demo for Pilot Wings and their revamped Wii collection of the Star Wars Rogue Squadron titles. In both games, they essentially serve the same purpose on a gameplay level. The player could tilt their head to control the in-game camera, creating a solution for the Wii Remote's lack of a C-stick, even when coupled with a nunchuck. Via head tracking, players could naturally manipulate their viewpoint by turning and locking inside the screen with a 3D effect of sorts. Julian told me that it worked like a charm and that the effect was especially impressive when switching to the first person cockpit view built into both games. To take advantage of this feature and encourage players to use it, the developers started to place easter eggs into the cockpits. For example, one artist added a picture of a cat to the interior of one of the vehicles. Former Factor 5 members are tight-lipped about why exactly this happened, but their pitch to do the Pilot Wings Wii game was eventually turned down by Nintendo in mid-2008. One ex-developer offered speculation that it might have been turned down due to Nintendo already working on the island flyover game in Wii Sports Resort, which was heavily inspired by Pilot Wings, and that they may have already had their own plans for the series at that point, since Pilot Wings Resort released just three years later. Regardless of this, Julian and his team remained determined to make the game happen, and reworked what they had already made into an 
original IP. Building upon their prototype and using the same ideas outlined in the pitch, it would be their proposed revival of Pilot Wings in all but name. The project from this stage onwards appears to have existed under a few different titles. At an early phase of development, it was referred to under the internal codename of Sky, before being called We Flight by some, and then We Fly. According to a former associate of the developer, it was apparently pitched to a small handful of well-known publishers, including 2K Games and Namco. None of them wanted to fund a full game. Eventually, however, the project landed on its feet with a company named Green Screen Interactive Software. Green Screen was a new publisher founded in New York City in 2008. In April of that year, they acquired Zoo Digital Publishing and Destination Software to make a new casual video game label called Zoo Games. Zoo had lofty aspirations of funding and producing original high-quality casual games from companies around the world. We Fly by Factor 5 was chosen to be among the first in this new venture. At one point, the game briefly ran into legal issues surrounding its name. Factor 5 had decided that its codename, We Fly, would become its official title, and had their legal representatives try to secure it. However, Nintendo would not allow them to call it that, believing that it would have infringed upon their trademark for the Wii game series that encompasses games like Wii Sports, Wii Play, Wii Fit, etc. Since Wii Fly had no official association with that series, they were told the name could not be used regardless of it being stylized as one word. In spite of this, Factor 5's management was still reluctant to change the title, having already grown fond of it. Instead of completely dropping the name, they chose to simply alter the spelling of Wii from WII to WE. That's not to suggest the games somehow lack Nintendo's blessing in any way. Former Factor 5 members say Nintendo was still maintaining a keen interest in everything they were working on. They gave the developers the green light to implement playable Mii characters into the game, and according to Julian Egbrecht, were even still on board to produce their aforementioned head tracking glasses. Altogether, the project is said to have been in the works for around just over a year, and was able to make substantial progress during that time. The team had built a plethora of distinct environments set around its virtual globe, it was a huge, sprawling world that pushed the Wii to its limits with advanced water effects and a global illumination lighting system. It all ran on Factor 5's internally made Lair Wii engine. This was basically the technology used to power Lair, upgraded and adapted for Nintendo's hardware. Players could roam the entire planet without pausing for loading screens, as it streamed Grand Theft Auto style. Each time a new location was discovered, it would be added to the globe on the main menu, allowing players to take off from there at the start of the next play session. Each city was filled with unique features and objectives to complete. Some of the missions were traditional pilot wings fare, where you'd have to fly through hoops, carefully land on platforms, or collect stars. Although Factor 5 was bringing to the table plenty of new ideas of their own too. At night, players could shoot fireworks at targets in the sky to create a fireworks display for the people below. They were also taking advantage of its real-world setting by challenging players to fly by famous landmarks and snap photos next to them. The lineup of playable vehicles was diverse, featuring in addition to the more expected jets, biplanes, hand gliders and rocket belts, some more outlandish choices that showed the game's wackier side. Players could eventually unlock a hot air balloon and a magic flying carpet. Factor 5 even had a second open world stage set on the moon, where players could explore such sites as a human colony using ships like a lunar spacecraft and a flying saucer. In development assets show that you could fly all the way to the North Pole where you could find Santa's workshop too. A feature that illustrates how Factor 5's developers were trying to take advantage of everything that we had to offer was its interaction with the console's weather channel. The now defunct application allowed Wii owners to check the weather around the world by navigating a three-dimensional globe interface. Factor 5 had negotiated with Nintendo to let them use data from the weather channel, allowing them to replicate live, real-life weather conditions inside the game. It also followed a real-time 24-hour day-night cycle accurate to every time zone. If there was an evening of rain in London while New York City was simultaneously enjoying clear skies in the afternoon, the game could effortlessly reproduce that. Overall, a good amount of Wii Fly appears to have been completed with a myriad of different locales mapped out, 
Towards the end of 2008, its development was brought to an abrupt close, when the studio was torn apart. After the publisher supporting one of their other projects at the time, Superman, fell to bankruptcy, Factor 5 Inc. began hemorrhaging money. On top of that, We Fly's publisher, Green Screen Interactive, was struck by similar issues. Unable to bear the brunt of the global financial crisis, they too went bankrupt. Without publisher backing, Factor 5 Inc. was forced to close down in December 2008. Some of their projects were would be briefly resumed in 2009 by another entity, but We Fly was not among them. The game's demise brought to an end the dream of officially supported desktop VR on Wii, as well as the developers' recurring attempts to bring their own take on pilot wings to the market. After years of coming close, it was not meant to be. Julian Egbrecht, speaking to me in 2017, told me the project was loved very much by those that worked on it. The remains of it exist now only in the private collections of former Factor 5 management. The Harry Potter franchise became nothing short of a global phenomenon in the 2000s, fueled in no small part by the success of its film adaptations. The Boy Who Lived soon became a household name, and the series would go on to gross many billions of dollars, launching various spin-offs and adaptations. There was a time, however, that another, very different vision for the Potter media empire was on the table. In the late 90s, it was none other than Japanese video game giant Nintendo that had their eyes on the Harry Potter rights with aspirations of transforming it into a video game series. I spoke to former Nintendo employees to discover how the company once tried to buy their way into the world of Harry Potter. Nintendo's fascination with the Harry Potter series began in around 1999. At this point in their history, the company had not long since dabbled in developing an exclusive game for their system using a license acquired from an external source. This arrangement was the foundation for 1997's GoldenEye 007 on Nintendo 64, Rare's acclaimed first-person shooter using the James Bond license. It was a break from tradition for Nintendo, who had previously made a point to cultivate their own intellectual property. The success of GoldenEye, former developers say, opened Nintendo's eyes to the potential of such collaborations and paved the way to them taking an interest in Harry Potter. The push within the wider company to look into buying the Harry Potter license is said to have originated from Nintendo of America. The idea was first being floated by Nintendo of America's management, which at the time was being run by Minoru Arakawa. Despite their Japanese headquarters ultimately having the final say on any major business decisions, Nintendo afforded some autonomy to their American branch, and this allowed them to pursue the Harry Potter IP when the opportunity presented itself. By 1999, J.K. Rowling's series had reached its third instalment, and its popularity was starting to erupt. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban became one of the fastest selling books of its time after its UK debut in July of that year, and the business world was starting to take notice. With the property's immediate potential for merchandising and adaptation, Adaptations becoming increasingly evident, J.K. Rowling opened a dialogue to auction off the rights to use Harry Potter in other mediums. The author is said to have been interested mostly in having movie adaptations of a series made, but that didn't stop Nintendo from making an offer of their own. They too had identified the burgeoning franchise as a potential moneymaker and wanted in. The group charged with the task of coming up with ideas for Nintendo-made Harry Potter games was Nintendo Software Technology. This studio, located just down the street from Nintendo of America's HQ in Redmond, Washington, had been founded only one year prior, with the objective of developing titles specifically for the Western market. A former Nintendo producer shared that they received strict instructions to read every Harry Potter book on the market from cover to cover in preparation. This totaled over 700 pages worth of reading material to catch up on within a few days. Nintendo software technology at the time was already midway into development on three other games, Ridge Racer 64, Bionic Commando, and a Game Boy Color version of Crystallis. A portion of developers from these projects were split into two groups to work on the big Harry Potter pitch. One of these would formulate ideas for a third-person adventure game that would adapt the main story of the books. The other had to create a concept for a spin-off video game game based around Harry Potter's fictional sport, Quidditch. Both of these would have been developed for the Nintendo 64, with the possibility for releases on other Nintendo platforms in the future. Nintendo wanted exclusive access to the video game rights, meaning that their 
their platforms would be the only places to find Harry Potter games. As the book series would continue, each feature Nintendo system going forward would have theoretically had its own Harry Potter games based around each book, developed by Nintendo's own teams, or so was the plan. Developers described the process of mapping out the pitches as what was a hectic week of experimentation and occasional disagreements about their direction. Initially, some of the artists visualising the world and characters of Harry Potter had planned to pursue an art direction similar to the cover art of the books. This was in response to comments JK Rowling had made in the press about wanting to preserve the Britishness of the books in any adaptations of the source material going forward. There was therefore an effort among artists on the project not to stray too far from the first book's art design, as envisioned by British illustrator Thomas Taylor. However, this soon received some pushback from the management of NST, who wanted the characters to be drawn in more of a manga-inspired style. After some heated debate over this, the artists eventually agreed to redraw the characters as instructed with a decidedly more Japanese look. Nintendo software technology didn't produce a full prototype for their Harry Potter concepts. Instead, art animations and mock 3D demos were created to show what the games might one day look like. Very few of the pitch documents have since been preserved, among the few that have survived are some concept art pieces showing Nintendo's vision for the Harry Potter world. One locale paid particular attention to was Hogwarts itself. In one Nintendo artist's interpretation of the iconic setting, the castle was imagined as sitting on a mountaintop above a long and winding road surrounded by forests. Despite Nintendo's lofty ambitions of a long-lasting partnership with the rights holders and a line of exclusive games, their attempt to gain access to Harry Potter was ultimately unsuccessful. According to former members of the team, representatives of JK Rowling weren't interested in their proposal. One ex-producer recalls that Nintendo found their asking price for the license to be simply too expensive. Although, some sources from the company suggest that Nintendo made further moves to pursue Harry Potter only a year later. Later. Following the rejection of Nintendo's first pitch, J.K. Rowling sold the Harry Potter movie rights in 1999. Various media companies had approached her with offers, including Universal and 20th Century Fox, but it was Warner Brothers with whom she was able to reach an agreement. A film adaptation of the first book was soon put into pre-production, scheduled for a 2001 release. In 2000, the rights to do a video game to tie into the movie were put up for sale. A number of big game industry names again came forward, such as Microsoft and Nintendo. The big N entered discussions to develop the adaptations for their systems, and again was outdone, this time by Electronic Arts. With both Microsoft and Nintendo wanting to develop the Harry Potter games exclusively for their respective machines, the rights holders went with Electronic Arts in order to reach the widest audience possible. EA was able to develop their adaptations of the Philosopher's Stone movie for as many platforms as they desired. In its initial 2001 release, it came to Microsoft Windows, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and PlayStation. Notably, the platform that Nintendo had most wanted a Harry Potter game on, the Nintendo 64, was excluded. Following the success of the first game, EA continued to partner with Warner for the remainder of the movie series, producing adaptations of each film up until Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 in 2011.